Hello, and thank you for all of us to be uh, here in New Zealand, we are going uh, to say. And thank you, uh, above all, to uh, University of Auckland and Massey University to organize this uh, FHS uh, uh, Congress uh, virtually, but uh, with our heart in uh, New Zealand. Thank you to Tracy Adams and thank you to Kirsty Carpenter who invited me one year before and uh, it's my pleasure to be with you uh, today or tonight, it depends on how many of you, you look this uh, video. I want to give my thanks also to all the colleagues who accept my invitation to participate to this panel uh, regarding uh, how to write history during a time of revolution. I want to speak about, uh, of course, Colin Jones, and then Antonia Perna, Kirsty Carpenter, and uh, Céline Borrell. Thank you to all of you to be uh, with me around uh, this idea I proposed to develop uh, one year ago. My idea, my hypothesis was to work on how is it possible to write a story of the past during a strong time, during a so strong time, which name is revolution. And this revolution has to invite us to imagine uh, the future. So how to deal with the past when you are going to create the future? The question is not so naive, why? Because in fact, uh, there is very little study uh, about uh, how to write, how to imagine, uh, how to compose a story of France, for example, during the, the, the revolution. Of course, in New Zealand, we have uh, John Zizek, who have worked, one of the first, on the way to uh, say, to act and to write the history of the past during the first years of the revolution. But uh, except Joe Zizek, there are very few uh, historians, uh, either women or men, who have been interested by this topic. So, I would want to uh, write some hypothesis and not uh, in my part, in my count. I would want to, to work on, a, I hope, on an original uh, topic. It's a Republican history, pre-Republican pre history, because I will speak about a text written in 1791. In fact, a lot of uh, historians uh, think that uh, when they speak about history during the revolution, they think to the counter-revolution. And it's easy to imagine that a lot of historians have uh, conceived that uh, historians of the France before 1789 were all counter-revolutionaries because they were less invested in the public end, because they have times to, to think the, the past because they have nothing to do in the present. And they imagine that the militants, the sanculottes, the montagnards, the Jacobins, the actors of the revolution were so invested, so occupied to make revolutions that they have no time to, to think to the past. It's not just. It's not just because uh, Parker, the great uh, American historian, Claude Mosset, la grande historienne française, um, have demonstrated that history of the past was so important for the reference or political reference in the discourse, in the pictures of the cultural debate during the revolution. And uh, I recently worked on a man who uh, have a, a lot of, a lot of uh, books about, uh, a lot of books about uh, French Revolution. And this man is Louis-Charles de la Vicomterie, and you can see in the PowerPoint, the third image, uh, Les Crimes des Rois de France, uh, from 1790 to 1792, with a lot of re-edition. He writes Les Crimes des Rois de France, and then with the success, arrived Les Crimes des Papes, Crime of the Popes, and then with uh, the real success, he writes also Les Crimes des Empereurs. And so, uh, we, so we, we have three titles who demonstrate a strong topic, a strong focalization on the wish to demonstrate how the kings, how the most important personage of the antric regimes, kings, popes, emperors, were all murderers, were all kill, killers 
were all bad uh, person uh, who have uh, thousands and thousands murders uh, murders on their conscience. But in this story of, of Titan, a pair of text very strange, and this text very strange was the title whose title is Les crimes des reines de France depuis le commencement de la monarchie jusqu'à Marie Antoinette. So we have in this story of four titles, one who is absolutely con con uh, concentrated on women and not uh, uh, special women who were the queen of France. So this uh, title is very strange because there is it's an um, anonymous uh, edition. And this anonymous edition appeared in 1791 for first. And if you read the text uh, carefully, you can see that he appears after the repression of July 1791, after the uh, escape of the, of, the, of the king, when the station of the couple, king and queen, begin to, to be very uh, hard uh, in France. La notice de la Bibliothèque nationale, the French uh, notice of the National uh, Bibliothèque of France, indicates that this book could be written by Louise Félicité Guinemont de Keralio. We all know, knew, know uh, Louise uh, de Keralio. In reality, uh, this anonymous uh, uh, presentation, uh, then certificated by notice, does not convince me. And first uh, hypothesis of my uh, work today, uh, besides you, uh, and I uh, wait for your critics, of, of course, is to imagine that it's not. It's not Louis de Keralio who wrote this book, but uh, Charles Louis, uh, Richard de la Vicomterie. And um, I think that, and it would be uh, the second point of my uh, hypothesis of work, uh, there are two kind of text in this uh, Crime des Reines de France. Of course, there is a story about uh, the queens and uh, about queens and their bad attitudes during from, uh, from the 6th century to the 18th century. But there is a second hidden text uh, all around these 500 pages. And I think that uh, this second hidden text is a text against the place of the woman in the politics of the French Revolution. In fact, I think that there are two texts, one uh, text visible and one text invisible in this 500 text. And the position of the well-known misogyne uh, Charles-Louis de la Vicomterie can explain this second hidden text who is clearly a threat against all women, not only queen, but all simple women who, who would want to uh, make uh, politics and be interested by the life of the politics, of the clubs, of the participation to the uh, uh, revolution. So let's go in quickly in a few uh, remarks that I would want to uh, explain regarding uh, these, uh, these texts. Um, it said that uh, if you look at the second image, uh, Annie Duprat has worked so much to demonstrate that the, before to execute really the King of France, uh, he says, you have to prepare the public opinion. And the king, and it's a very nice title of uh, Annie Duprat, was uh, killed several times before he was really killed. So the, the facts were so enormous, so gigantic to kill a king that they have, they, the revolutionaries, more radicals, have to prepare the, the kill or the, or the um, execution of the, of the king. And I remarked that it's the same thing for the queen. It's not uh, so easy to, to, to execute uh, the queen. It's not because she is Aust from Austria or she is a woman that it's so easy. You have also to prepare, to prepare public opinion that the execution of the queen would be possible. And so it's very interesting to see how Charles-Louis de la Vicomterie, because I think that he, the book, the book Charles-Louis de la Vicomterie had imaging to... Uh, 
make a long narrative from uh, more than uh, 1,000 euros, from 1,300 euros, going to the first woman of Clovis, to the last woman of Nices, to describe the turpitude, to describe the debauchery of the queens of uh, France. So we have the first deal of the uh, author is to destroy is to destroy the monarchy. How we, we deal with the monarchy and what is the place that uh, queens have to uh, afford to uh, destroy monarchy? But really, it's uh, really important for, for him to, to demonstrate that in the monarchy, who has the real power? It's not the man. The man, the kings, have not really the power. So it's very interesting because it's a story of France by the woman. Looking to the woman, he rebuilds all the story of the kingdom, of the monarchy of France, describing for, his, for him, point of view, for his point of view, of course, what were the default, what were the faults, what were the uh, vices of this monarchy. And the vices were uh, clearly uh, incarnated by the figure of the queen. The trans monarchy, it's made say that it was a trans monarchy for a real Vicontery, was a trans monarchy for what reason? Because uh, La Vicontery explains that monarchy has changed its sex. La monarchy avait changé de sex. Very important to understand that a woman making politic make, creates confusion in the repartition and the uh, assignation of war in a gender politics. So, La Vicontery explains that the uh, weakness and the uh, vicious consciousness of the monarchy during more than 1,300 1, years was the fault of the woman because they had the real power. And it's very interesting because right or wrong, right or wrong, the most important is to consider, is to consider that the hypothesis of uh, um, La Vicontery is perhaps not so uh, uh, wrong, evidently, not saying that it was a fault of the monarchy, but it was a fact, a real fact, that the queen had real mm, power. Second demonstration, and I would want to uh, here to insist on the PowerPoint, on the frontispiece. Frontispiece is really extraordinary because we have an image I will not have time to develop, but you can see uh, uh, it uh, with more serenity or more time to uh, uh, observe uh, the power full of this image. You have a murmured in the center, who represents uh, the uh, bed uh, queen. And we have two male figures, the young prince, which is a uh, guy, and the king, who is uh, slaughtered. And with them, the, the, the figure of the symbol of a male masculine fidelity, uh, what uh, we call the, the, the wall of the dog here. You can see the, the peacock. Uh, on the cock, and it's a clearly a sexual symbol of the victory of the woman uh, on the man. And you can see behind uh, behind the, the queen, you can see a figure very interesting. It's a figure of politics, Machiavellian figure with a dress of a skin tiger, uh, which is very uh, interesting. She is hiding in her dress a sword and a torch. And you can see at the left of the picture, the judge, uh, the judge, uh, the general, and the court, the man who are under the power of the queen. So it's a clear representation, a very rich representation of uh, the political life. And just just at the first uh, state of the picture, you can see the history, the, geni the genius of history, incarnated by another woman, it's important, who have the courage to have pain in hand to react and to uh, write the, um, the good, the good uh, story. So uh, to uh, go more quickly on the long development on 500 pages that uh, 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 La Vicomterie uh, gave to all the 
be a biography of Queen. Of course, they are bad figure, worse, the worst figure in this story are well known because they are uh, Catherine de Médicis, Bruno, uh, Frédégonde, and de Bretagne. And his with this portrait, the last portrait and the worst portrait, of course, in the burden uh, actuality of 1791, is Marie uh, Antoinette. So we are going to finish to give some ideas about the ways that uh, uh, La Vicanterie use or uh, writes uh, around Marie Antoinette to understand, to understand uh, how this piece not so well known by specialists of Marie Antoinette who are not using this uh, this book used as a pamphlet, as a caricatures, but not so many times this book of La Vicomterie. And is uh, all the contrary very uh, into, uh, interesting to, uh, to read it. First of all, he explains that his dress attitude and uh, this will address uh, Tracy Adams. Uh, this dress, his, her dress attitude is very uh, shamed, shamed in the France of the end of the 18th uh, century. She wears, and she, and she makes, uh, knows that she wears a negligé, uh, a negligé, what we call in France, and déshabillé. Uh, it's not only a symbol of simplicity, of the country at the end of the 18th century. A woman who in public opinion, where a negligé who make no such wear a negligé is a prostitute. So it's very, uh, uh, La Vicomterie seems to be very shocked by uh, this uh, kind of negligé that uh, Marie Antoinette uh, wear. And the worst is that the negligé, we are after 1786, so after the signature of the trade, commercial trade between France and England, this negligee is uh, built, is uh, done in England. So it's also a, a fault because uh, it's symbol of uh, importance of French uh, industry, text textile uh, industry. Second uh, default, very, very strong and very well developed by uh, La Vicomterie is uh, the default that he can't write, like Abu. He can't uh, speak more, but uh, he explained enough to make it uh, uh, very understandable. It's that uh, contamination, contamination of bad manners. In clear, uh, La Vicomterie critics Marie Antoinette for his homosexuality. It's very clear, and he says that it's the worst, it's the worst default that he can uh, reproach to the queen to have introduced into the uh, life of the court the homosexuality. Because not only she contamines and affects, it's the real world, uh, the woman, but she contamines, she has contaminated all the men, and here we have a citation, and uh, Fersen appears, and he's supposed uh, lovers also arrive. So it's worse that this woman could, uh, do, could do to uh, the Meur uh, Francaise. And third, she is a stranger. Here appear the detestation of the Austrian woman. We arrive in some something more, more, more classic. We have uh, this in the image number eight of the PowerPoint, where the Autrichienne uh, became as a game of bestialization, or the Autruchienne in a in game with the word in France, or Autruchienne, uh, the female dog, with all the symbol of sexuality uh, that uh, brings, or Autruchienne, la hyène, uh, the animal very ferocious, manus, uh, African animal, animal very, uh, very uh, ferocious, uh, who is uh, well known. These three forms of bestialization are really remarkable and very uh, make a very bad reputation to the queen. Finally, I'm going to uh, finish saying that you can read uh, these 500 books thinking that uh, a man, radical patriot, speaks about uh, queens of France. In reality, when you look mm, very specifically and the development regarding the politics of women and the role of women in politics, 
you realize that he doesn't speak only about queen. He speaks about queens in the past, but when he goes on generality, we say in France that he monte en generality, when he takes like a moral lesson about the role of few women in politics, he speaks for all women and he writes for all women, saying that women has to be virtuous mother, saying that women does not, do not have to be in the sphere public, saying that the violence and the exigence of the politics life impeach the woman to be good politician. So arrive at the end, a double target, a double target, a target very well known with a, with a name. It's Marie Antoinette. And as his husband, she has been killed before she has been executed. Well, but there is another target. It's there are all the women who pretend to be citizens, who pretend to make politics. And here we have not all, not uh, in generalization uh, versus all the, all the men, but we have clearly a branch of Jacobinism, of pre montagnardis or pre republicanism we are in the summer 1791, who demonstrate clearly to want to create a republic without a woman. And I think that uh, here we have with Richard de la Vicomterie, a man really important to imagine this kind of republic. It's not a coincidence, and I will finish here, that if this man, one year after, will participate to the Comité de Sûreté Générale, who prepare the vote of the 30 October 1793, over the pitch women to create clubs. Thank you very much. Thank you.